Anyway. And we're off. <laughs> Welcome to a special edition of Cambridge Inside Out, the sequel. And we're going to save the sequel here this time. My name is Robert Winters. I'm Susanna Sagat and Glenn Kutcher. And actually, I was watching some old Cambridge Inside Out shows, which we'll get to in a second. And it wasn't, it was called, it had a subtitle. What was it? it was Cambridge Inside Out. Issues and something. Those must rather. be the old ones. For, for, okay. the, for those not, that not in the know, uh, <laughs> our guest this week uh, was the originator of Cambridge Inside Out, which ran for how many years? I ran for 11 years. 11 years from what, 1989? And 25 years ago we started the program. 25 years ago. And, uh, and so when we were debating a name for our show here, we absolutely were without a clue and, and until we asked you if you wouldn't mind if we just <laughs> lifted it. And, you were okay, so yeah. we're, we're pretty happy. Who remembers? It was a right? great show. It was weekly, right? We had fun. We were, we were on every week. Uh, we had uh, Barbara Ackerman, Sandra Graham, Tom Rafferty, Marty Foster. A great group. Uh, and you just talked about All still about around, all uh, following local events, although, although Tom has pursued uh, another career. He's a priest now. That's right. Actually, yeah. he, he was officiating at the funeral for Billy Walsh. Oh. Uh. Right. They brought him, brought him back in for, okay. as the, the in-town guy. It was pretty good. So we're hoping that this show will encourage you all to do a sequel. A sequel. You guys are doing the sequel. No, right. I mean just a one-time sequel. sequel. Oh, period. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> one-time sequel is right. Right. So now, here we are. Now, uh, um, again, just for background, you know, sometimes I just I, I have this rather false notion that some, uh, anybody who's watching this program has, was sort of born in the you know, during when Eisenhower was pre uh, president, and you know they're all f familiar with everything that's gone down in Cambridge in the last thirty years. It's probably I mean, true. Well, maybe it's true of the people. Except for those of us born in the Truman administration. Right. Exactly. Okay. exactly. So a lot of people may never have seen Cambridge Inside Out in the in the, mm -hmm. the original. Uh, you know, and, you know, it's, I I thought it was sort of worth mentioning here. Anyway, a well, it was where you went to get the current events. What it, was happening in politics? Uh, what was you happening know, not in the to, city? Not, not to start anything, but the Chronicle was in its decline, wasn't doing a lot of coverage. We talked about this. Yeah. We, you and I talked about it, too. There was yeah. no place to get any information. That's right. And now uh, it's even worse. Uh, and now it's worse. That's correct, uh, yeah. because there's no one to uh, filter it out. And what is uh, uh, a few blogs and this program and, and what's left of the Chronicle, which isn't much. All right. Actually, one of the uh, reporters for the Cambridge Chronicle, Erin uh, Baldessari, she's now, I believe, headed off to California, which has been, that sort of is, tends to be the pattern with the local papers. Well, the ranks of people who came out of the Chronicle and covered us locally and then went, went on is, is actually quite, uh, quite large. So this is the place to start. It, Tony Baldo ended up at 60 Minutes. Yeah. Uh, 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 a few others who've... Uh, I know one guy who's working for AP. You know, he was uh, editor for a while. David so. Wilson down in Connecticut. I mean, they, they, they actually, at one time, uh, uh, things were pretty good. But now you wonder where people get their information other than this program. Well, you know what? Universal Hub is a really good site. Okay. That's a, it's a news aggregator. Mm. If you haven't seen it. There's a lot of news aggregators now, and they have a Twitter feed. And whenever anything happens around... You send it to Universal Hub, and they uh, retweet it, and people send information. It's like a, a citizens. Yeah, there's no filter, though. Anybody can oh, put anything out that they want, which I suppose no is, is good, especially in a city like this, which empowers everyone to play and say. Yeah. So, uh, you just, well, uh, Universal Hub has a, at least a little bit of moderation. The person who runs it can sort of curate it a little bit, just mm -hmm. in case. I'll say here just in articles that I put together that ones that I found interesting uh, on Cambridge Civic Journal, we I had a really nice contribution from a, a fellow who's a former uh, board member of the Cambridge Redevelopment Authority, had really nice great histories about uh, Kendall Square, mm -hmm. and uh, I posted that and you know got a, got a lot of hits and then um, they they reposted it, uh, a link to it on Universal Hub and I I broke the re broke my all time record that day. Yeah. <laughs> People so think it, it just started last week when they arrived in the city. Yeah. The sense of where they came in. and I always thought that there were ten or fifteen thousand people who live in Cambridge and don't realize it, right. and that there was a huge voter base to be mobilized if somebody figured out how to get to them. And with social media, I think people have. For better or for worse, somebody can come out of no place yeah. and get elected to the city council. 
Well, you know, there was always, it was mm -hmm. like the David Clem theory of getting elected to the Cambridge City Council is you just go out and you find your quota. You know, invent it new. You don't have to, it's hard to pull away a number one That's vote true. from another person, but if you can, you know, if you have the audacity to go out there and register it, people. And it was always going. easier to get elected to the school committee than the city council. School committee was often a throwaway vote. Right. And uh, uh, so you could you could make a pitch and you could say, please vote for me. But city council, you had to take it away from somebody else. And those right. voters were loyal. Yeah. And I suspect even now, they're, they're still pretty loyal. Uh, well, I except for the fact that there's been such an amount of turnover, that the, the level of loyalty hasn't had a chance to build up. Well, and so, the turnout is terrible, yeah, too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, you don't have sort of legacy type uh, candidates like, uh, like, a, uh, like somebody from the Sullivan's. Uh, the last two legacy uh, people left, David Marr and Tim Toomey, with That's good, right. strong family names that, uh, right. that build them a solid, loyal core. And I think uh, you'd, have, you, you'd need the jaws of life to tear those votes away from, <laughs> from those constituents. Everybody else, well, Denise Simmons uh, is a good base in the city as well. I think that's probably uh, right. Yeah. But, but otherwise, I'm not sure that there are people with enough of a long-term base. To, uh, Mark McGovern might be building one, uh, might be building one now. But uh, Yeah, by the way, not everybody who's watching this program may know that you, you actually served on the school committee for some number of I years. I was elected. Alice Wolf and I were elected to public office on the same day right. 40 years ago. And despite what you might have heard, there were six other members on the school committee besides <laughs> Alice for, for the first eight years we spent together. And then she went to the city council. Well, she right. ran for city council and then ultimately went on, and I, and I did two more years. So I saw 12 years on the school committee. You know, right. now we're going to have to get Alice to come in and have equal time. You realize that, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, we've had Alice good luck, on. Good luck to you guys. We take all comers here. We, uh, we're... I, I will say it was very interesting because when I started going to school committee meetings, which were the late 60s and early 70s, Jimmy Fitzgerald, who'd been on the school committee since like 1931, right, on and off for, for 45 years, was still on the school committee. And thinking about that 45 years earlier, he had been, he'd been on since 1931, and just being able to watch sort of what worked over that period of time is extraordinary. I mean, it seemed a long time ago, but then since then, Fred Fantini's been on the school committee the since dean. 1981, and he's been on for 30, actually, though, 31 or 33 I'm years. I'm sure Freddie does, would not like me to emphasize it, but he was defeated one time. Once, and then and then came, came right back, back and, strong, and he's topping the ticket. Uh, Freddie, Freddie, I, I teased him about this because Freddie conducted. His brother served. His brother him, Donald right? served before him. His brother uh, George actually was the first brother to run in 1967, I believe. Uh, well, I don't know about George running. Yes, yeah, that was before Donald, and then when George decided that. Uh, he, he would pursue, as he did, a very successful career in, in banking and finance. Uh, Donald stepped in and actually got elected and did... Uh, the next, the very the next term. And Don did uh, the several terms, some interrupted by attempts to go to the city council. And then Freddie took over for Donald, took Donald's seat as soon as Donald stepped out. Were they twins? No. Freddie has a twin brother. Freddie does have a twin brother. But his brother. twin brother hasn't been involved in politics. Okay. His, right. brother, uh, his brother, Alan, who... Uh, right. They're not identical twins, so they don't. Oh, they look okay. alike, but they're they're easy to to tell. Yeah, I was, I was I was I wanted to pass some rumor about how actually Freddie sometimes steps out of the. No, he can't do that. No, that, that, no, that no, wouldn't no. work. No. That wouldn't work. <laughs> but the Freddie Freddie and I were in the same uh, fifth grade class at the Longfellow School. So I've known. How right. were his grades? <laughs> Freddie was Freddie was Freddie was a good student. Yeah. Uh, but we've known each other probably since 1959, 1960. So now. You were living, three seventy three Broadway, which is the in the house that George Bush lived in when he right. was a graduate student at business right. school. But we, the Coochers were out of there a long time before right. we, Bush. At, got at, at some point, we have to put together the definitive volume of all the well known people who've lived in the city. Lived, which you know, and I, and whenever I have met anybody, wait, George Bush lived in your house. George w? Bush the second, the George W. Bush lived at three seventy three Broadway when he was at Harvard Business with School. With his. This is pre-wife? Whoever he lived with, I don't know, but he, oh, he lived but there. Right. Before his family. Uh, the, I, I would always try to find out which apartment it was, because that, that was a six-unit house. And, and uh, then they broke them all up into yeah. two, so who knows which unit it was, because somebody lives in that unit, somebody owns it as a condo, and probably doesn't, doesn't know, know that George Bush lived there. Now, since I'm, I live like three houses away from that, I, I often joke with people and say that that's one famous American president who, who, who you will not be soon be seeing a blue oval historical marker 
uh, in yeah, front of might, the house. You might not see it there. But, uh, <laughs> right. I, so I always collected does the he, addresses. Does he have a library yet? Uh, I don't know whether he has because a Because you can write it's, to the library and uh, ask them. a bad <laughs> idea whose time has still not yet come. I can't tell you that. It's a well, library. He, has a lot of pop-up books. Yeah. No, uh, whenever I've met anybody. a librarian. She would care. Yeah, that's true. When, that's whenever true. I met anybody famous who lived in Cambridge, I always asked, uh, you, if, I, if I had a chance to talk to them, you know, Pat Schroeder, for example, the, yeah. the member of Congress from, Calif yeah. from Colorado. Yeah, she lived here too. So I, she, well, she went to Harvard Law School. So I said, where did you live? And she yeah. said, I lived on Sacramento Street. And You're we used me. to go to that great deli on Mass Ave. What was it called? The Midget, which you, yeah. you wouldn't remember. I don't know, I don't uh, Claude Pepper, the, uh, the great yeah. political yeah. godfather of progressive causes, the senator in uh, 1937. Uh, from Florida, lived at 8 Sacramento Street. Wilbur Mills lived in Sacramento Street. You're who, kidding me. Wilbur Mills, who was the yeah. architect of, uh, of Medicare. I think yeah. I sold a backyard composter to a guy named Jack, who lives in that building. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wilbur <laughs> and, Mills, uh, he had the scandal, right? The, uh, you know, if it hadn't been for a woman named Fanny Fox, we would it. have had national health insurance back in the 1960s. You're always blaming women. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Wilbur didn't want to, yeah, whatever. He lived on Sacramento Street? He lived as a law student. Yeah. Yeah, and, and you think of all the famous people that have passed through. And, and Susan uh, Sontag lived here. I didn't know that. She lived on Craigie Street. I, th I think Hillary Clinton may have lived here because I know she worked in Harvard Square for the Children's Defense Fund. And I oh. did once meet Marion Wright Edelman, and I asked her, uh, who, for whom she worked at the time, right. and I did ask her where she thought Hillary Clinton. Steve Buckley has been after me to keep Buck. that information, because right. he's another Cambridge uh, political junkie. In fact, he called me once to tell me, uh, did you know that Fred Allen, the radio comedian, spent time in Cambridge? I said, right. Yes, and actually, the Kutcher backyard and the, 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 the back uh, well, front no. porch of his grandparents your, the current we're, we're back back the, uh, the previous one. Uh -oh. We lived on Trowbridge Street after that, and we backed right. up to Emmons Place, and that's where Fred Allen's grandparents lived. Well, you know, Hillary's coming to Cambridge th this month. I'll ask her. She probably will not call me, but if you get a hold of her, I'd love to know if she ever lived <laughs> in Cambridge. She's doing a book signing. Lived. Really? So we'll mm -hmm. have to find some way to is there, is, get that information. Is release date for her book today or tomorrow? Or no, something? it was yesterday, I think. It was yesterday? Oh, okay. Okay, mm -hmm. All right. I don't think she, we, we can read it and see if her address is in But it, it is always fun. Everywhere you go, there's somebody who's passed through Cambridge and lived here. Yeah. And uh, reminiscing with people who uh, will talk about, oh, there was that supermarket off Kirkland Street with the lady who sat at the cash register, <laughs> Mrs. Savinor, uh, and all the uh, people who, who would say, uh, you, you've you seen John Kenneth Galbraith? He only lived across the street. Oh, we used yeah. to see him on the street all I the time. I see him. How could you miss him? But, but in Cambridge, seeing and... academic celebrities is like being in Washington oh, and seeing yeah. politicians yeah. or living in New York City and seeing famous people. It's no big deal. You know, actually, I, I always laugh uh, where, I, where I teach. Um, in my classroom is occasionally, I'm preceded by Alan Guth, who is like the inventor of the inflationary theory of the, uni of the you know, expansion of the universe, and I get to go in after him and erase the board. I get to joke with my class. You erase his board? Yeah, I say, I'm here. I'm destroying the universe. I <laughs> <laughs> brush with greatness. Actually, he bicycles in. I run into him. In a, in a useless too. bit of trivia, around the corner is the building that uh, Edwin Land first started, his Polaroid company, in a in a small building that he bought from my grandfather On in Main the Street? 1930s. Yeah. Oh, okay. Is it still there? If we'd there? only known what he had. I think believe the building was still there. But he didn't offer stock exchanges in exchange worth something at one point, but hey. Actually, some of the uh, the the uh, the people that I you mentioned to me who've lived in Cambridge in the past that mm -hmm. people I didn't know were musical figures. Various. Uh, well, Leroy Anderson. Uh, every time I hear sleigh ride, you realize Mrs. Anderson, uh, his wife who's still living in Connecticut, gets a piece of that. Right. And uh, there was a they, they created a square for Leroy Anderson. And he, he, he was, was a real here? Cambridge guy. He, he lived. His father was a postmaster in Central Square. Yeah. He lived in a three decker <laughs> on Chatham Street, uh, in the house that Ziggy Jarosowitz bought. And Ziggy threw his oh. piano out, not knowing. Oh, what really? it was. Oh. oh. Yeah. I think I was so, there when they were doing the dedication of a street corner. You there. may well have been. The, yeah. the pop showed up, and yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. The, the Harvard band showed up, and it was very impressive. <laughs> <laughs> Cambridge mm -hmm. is such a little village, isn't it? It, it really is. <laughs> but he was a real Canterbridgean. I mean, he, he wasn't somebody who came here to go to school and then left. 
He stayed here? Oh, I stayed. Wait, I stayed. He stayed. All right. right. Okay. All right. You know, actually, one of the uh, one of the best things I ever posted up on a Civic Journal website was authored by this guy right here. It was called, uh, I, I'll give you the little bit of the background, was I think it was when I, because I moved here in 1978, it was in 1998, it was like 20 years, and I just was sort of making a joke about how the fact I've been living here 20 years, longer than any kid at the high school. Not yet, yet a Canterbridge. Yet, I'm not yet a Canterbridge yeah. yet, right? And several people sent in great little pieces for the, um, you know, that I posted soon thereafter uh, about, you know, the problem of how you can live in a place for your entire life almost, but never be a true resident there. And sure. Glenn wrote this great piece called How to Become a True Canterbridgean, which was perfect. Step one, buy the first round. <laughs> oh, <laughs> definitely. <absolutely. laughs> By the seventh round, you'll be one of the. And, but then you know you leave ones. Cambridge and you realize every community is of the same culture. Yes. That you've got your lifetime Southboro residents or Southbridge residents or Holyoke residents or North Adams or Pittsfield, where I was yesterday, and uh, uh, you can live there for 35, 40 years, and and you'll still be considered from away or from outside. One of the the best comments I saw was a guy from Vermont said he moved there, lived in the town for decades had grandchildren even there and and they said asked him well you know I've got children and grandchildren they've gone through all the schools here and you still treat me like I'm an outsider and somebody looked back and he says you can put a mouse in an oven doesn't make it a biscuit <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> and then it kind of said it all right there <laughs> For those of you just tuning in, we're here with our special guest, Glenn Kucher, who was an original host for the Cambridge Inside Out show that started 25 years ago. Actually, Glenn, let me ask you something. It's sort of a curiosity. I was thinking about this earlier today. Because you, you left the school committee in, what, 1985, 86? Uh, 1985, January 85. of 1985. All right. Uh, and uh, at some point, you the inspiration must have come to you to put together Cambridge Inside Out. Um, you missed the school My coming. fantasy career, <laughs> since Other than I was I, not going to be a center fielder for the Boston Red Sox. I, wanted, star, to, I a, wanted to be Jimmy Pearsall's job. Or a star in a Broadway musical. Uh, I, wanted, I didn't want to star in one. I wanted to write them. Okay. I wanted to write music and lyrics for Broadway. All right. It's another fantasy career. That? But in order to do that, you had to practice the piano. Oh, okay. And there I know go. something about music. So um, <laughs> that wasn't going to happen. But I, I did want to be a broadcast journalist. I really yeah. did. Uh, in fact, during the 1969 takeover of University Hall, I was there with my camera and a tape recorder. Really? Sort of recording, not not to squeal on anybody who was inside the building, yeah. destroying Harvard's records, but just to have a record of stuff that was happening. And I still have the cassette tape really? that I did of that. And and uh, uh, most of the pictures are gone because I gave them to the people who were in them, uh, so that they would not be incriminated later. I see. And the, uh, <laughs> A very uh, prominent member of the Cambridge community who will remain nameless, who was hanging out the window of but University you can tell me later. <laughs> whatever. Uh, so uh, when cable came, yeah, I thought, well, wouldn't it be great if if we could do something like this on the local cable system because you had nothing to lose? What's the worst case scenario? They take away a gig that you don't get paid for. Exactly. Right. And uh, when, when, uh, when uh, you know, we went through five iterations of the cable company. It ended up being Continental, but before it was American Cable or whatever it was. And they were doing some of their community uh, interviews about how can we serve the community. And Back when they were obliged to do so. When they were obliged to do so. And I was one of the people that they talked to. And I said, you know, you guys might want to think about doing this kind of stuff. And I said, by the way, you know, I had talked with Marty Foster, and and uh, Marty Foster and I have known each other since we were kids. Our, right. our fathers knew each other, and our grandparents knew each other. And uh, Tom Rafferty, who uh, I had actually worked with at Blue Cross and Blue Shields, was Tom was a very effective uh, lobbyist for Blue Cross at the time. And we had talked about uh, doing something with the local cable system, wouldn't it be fun to have something that sort of emulated the McLaughlin Group or Inside <laughs> Washington? I, I, was, I was joking with Suzanne all I think it was the last week. I went, issue one. <laughs> right. Well, the, the McLaughlin Group had, had, had started, and they were on, and we were getting it in Boston. And uh, Tom, uh, 
I'm, I'm having a brain fart, and I'm not going to remember his name, but, but the, the guy from, uh, uh, who, who put the stuff together at uh, Media One, and, and Steve Marks, who was the producer, Cole? said, uh, Tom Cole. Tom Cole. Oh, sorry. And I Steve remember, Marks said, I remember from the credits. If you guys want to do this, we'll produce it. I mean, nobody's yeah. getting paid, and you're all going to pay for your own cable. So um, we actually, uh, uh, Lester mentioned. Lee was part of our original team. Who, who? Lester Lee. Oh, Lester Lee was Yeah, well, Lee? Lester really? and I went to high school together. Oh, okay. Uh, and then Lester got a faculty position, and, and uh, he was busy uh, teaching, not available. And uh, so Sandra Graham bumped into her, and she said, uh, I'd love to be part of this. And Barbara Ackerman was part of it from the beginning, because... Uh, Barbara was probably, of all the people who served locally and could talk to both sides of, yeah. the, of the aisle, mm -hmm. uh, Barbara was the one who was uh, the one that people liked the best. Right. They respected her. Uh, Barbara never needed attention. She was always looking to divert attention to other people, always had a good thing to say about everybody, did her, did her stuff and, and, and uh, work well and, and was very thoughtful. Had she so, already been mayor by then? Uh, she had been mayor. Oh, and she had her book out, You the, Ma you the Mayor, was the name of her book. Right. And uh, that had just come out. Yeah. So she was, uh, uh, she was hot so, at the so, time. So that was part of her book tour. That was part of the book tour. <laughs> and we, we, did a, you know, we did a pilot and we started doing them. Uh, we did two shows every two weeks. One was live and one was taped for the next week. Right. That's we did it for 11 years. Did yeah. you change your clothes for the two shows? Uh, you know, uh, there are people who think that I own one blue blazer <laughs> and one pair of khaki pants. I own a half a dozen blue blazers <laughs> in six different sizes and about 30 pairs of khaki pants. And, and, and I spent $4 for this tie, so please. Oh, we're <laughs> glad you yeah. wore it. So I wore it just for that. You have my respect. <laughs> yeah, and, and you know, the we, 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 uh, first show we ever did, we had John O'Brien from the Cambridge Hospital. R really? And, yeah, and the okay. next thing we know, Everybody wants to come on at election time, and yep. uh, Bill Weld came on, and, and we did a show with. Uh, we did Bill a, Weld came on yeah. when he was running for governor. And went yep, and when when Tom Finneran was was the uh, uh, a rising legislator, not yet the speaker, uh, opposed to the public funding of election. public art. Art. And the Maplethorpe show was coming in. We had the uh, head of the uh, the gallery uh, up at uh, Andover that. Uh, held the Maplethorpe show, right. and, uh, and we, uh, and Finneran came on, and, and that uh, got us uh, nominated for what were then Cable Ace Awards for the uh, Best Locally Produced Talk Show. We didn't win, but it's, so wait, as, the it's Maple as close to a Tony Award as I was <laughs> The Maplethorpe show was in Andover, Massachusetts? It, when it came to Boston, it was hosted, I believe it was hosted there, and the head of the gallery was on our program with us defending that stuff. Uh, Tom Finneran was there talking about public funding shouldn't go to support a lot of this stuff. And we had a really good discussion about, you know, public art. There's a lot of public art out there that's good, and some of it's not so good, and you have to see it every day. You don't yeah. get a chance to, yeah. to comment. And so it wasn't specifically a Cambridge issue? Uh, it was not a Cambridge issue, but, but we just did it. We also did... Uh, we did a lot of very interesting programs and stuff that, that came on, but finding 52 shows a, a year um, and figuring out how to get people to come on, I don't think people realize just how, how difficult that is for you guys, which is why I'm yeah. really happy that you guys are doing this. By the way, this. Susanna, who do we got for next week? <laughs> <You're right>. oh, <laughs> no. That's we'll exactly find right. There we go. <laughs> now, but it was good the way it was set up physically. It was a, in a table, so and there, well, was there were two cameras or one? Oh, at uh, least they, did, they did three cameras. Three yeah, cameras. Yeah, and they yeah. produced it. We didn't yeah. have to yeah, do anything you guys with but the show up. Yeah, that was great. And then finally, uh, when, when uh, uh, Continental took over, not Continental, who's got it now? Um, Comcast. When Comcast took over, they stopped all local produced stuff, and uh, we actually paid to, do, to produce our last program. Really? And the last show that? we did. What did you have on that last show? Uh, we were just rounding up what we've done and saying you will not see us next week on oh. Cambridge. I said, oh, good luck. And, and you know, at that point, uh, um, we were all ready to move on. I'd, I'd uh, taken a job that was going to keep me a little more yeah. busy, less flexibility than I right. had. So uh, it was a good time to move on. I, I, I miss it. I'm sorry that Cambridge um, hasn't really had the kind of local attention that it might want up to now. Uh, but it hadn't, didn't have it then either. So, All right. Uh, you know, everybody's trying to do what needs to be done. I wish we had a daily newspaper. 
which Frank Duhay and I actually talked about a long time ago, if we could raise the money to put together a daily newspaper. You might have lasted until 1990 or 95. One person actually tried it as an experiment, but I think unless you get a certain amount of investment in it to really put it all out there, it's almost doomed from the yeah. start. Well, and it has to be on a computer now. So as a result, you can't get the public yeah. riled up to stuff except what the uh, what the uh, issue activists want you to know. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's actually do what the Herald and the Globe do. That's a little bit of what, so right now we're in this kind of sea of substitution where there are activists and blogs and listservs mm -hmm. and uh, and even elected officials who send out their newsletters and you know I'm not I don't want to say everything is biased but the thing is everything is slanted. And it's, you know, and, and listen, people even accuse me of being slanted, and I think sometimes I am. Depends on how much well, sleep I Well, we were I've slanted. Had. Yeah. I mean, we, we, we made no bones about it. We all had our um, yeah. our, our biases. We, we, we didn't yeah. endorse anybody on television, but we did make predictions about who we thought would win, which right. would always piss people off as you yeah. get yeah. close to a local election. And in right. fact, you know, if you had somebody on... And you ask the right questions three or four weeks before an election. Oh, yeah. You could help somebody. You could help somebody out, especially yeah. in a local election. And we also, we had a, we had a, sort of a, an unwritten agreement okay. that forty-five seconds. If there was somebody that none of us wanted, yeah, or didn't like, we wouldn't have them on. <laughs> yeah. <There you go. laughs> well, I'm Sorry. I'm proud to say. I was a guest. As when I was a guest, I so was a guest Susanna. too. Susanna, Susanna was a guest. I'm, I'm trying to find that show. So this is. <laughs> so, would you come back for the next half hour? Sure. Excellent. Really good. So we are done for this half hour, and we'll be back in three minutes. Right. We're actually now have to finish out the 15 seconds here in some graceful so we'll speak way. Slowly. I, I, I should have brought a Coke and done some product placement. There we go. Else. Excellent. You until, just did. <laughs> until three minutes from now, this has been Cambridge Inside Out. And we're out. <laughs>